Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to April. Can you even believe it? Here we are ushering in a new season, hopefully. We heard some talk this morning about the snow and ice blanketing our state um, with some fantastic energy and entertainment from one of our panelists today, Cadence Nunn with her band None Above. How fun is this? And the song is all about connection, which is so, so relevant to the work that we are all doing here. Um, I'm really digging the music in the in the intro. I what do you think? Should we uh, incorporate music into our session kickoff? I'm kind of liking that. 
Uh, let me know in chat. Caden, thank you so, so much for sharing your talents with us this morning. Um, we'll hear more from you later, and I'm really looking forward to it. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. Thank you, James. So here you'll see a landscape of the sessions that we have coming up today or through this year. Um, uh, and you'll see what we've got coming on the, the rest of the months here. But my name is Jessica Miller. I'm the Director of Workforce Strategy with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, DEED. And this is Workforce Wednesday. You're in the right spot. We're so happy that you've chosen to join us this morning for our special edition April Workforce Wednesday session focusing on cultivating a supportive workplace culture for youth. And one thing that we know for sure is that it takes 18 years to grow a workforce. So any time spent focusing on our young people and upcoming workforce time is time well spent. I'm hearing from employers all over the state that they are focusing their energy on youth for a couple of reasons. One, they're showing results through the number of hires. And two, the culture work that is required to be an employer of choice for this talent pool is paying off in retention efforts spanning their entire workforce. So you're in the right you're in the right place today. We're happy that you're here. If you're new, thank you for joining us. If you're returning, thank you for coming back. We have so many great speakers lined up for you today that we are trying something a little bit different. We won't be having our traditional unplugged Q and A session today, but we'll be using that time instead to extend our panel discussion. We just have so many things we couldn't fit it into an hour. Uh, so the the discussion will go until 1230, but we'll be utilizing our chat feature pretty heavily today for questions throughout our time together. So questions, comments, please pop them all into the chat. Answer questions. If you know the answer, interact with each other, um, interact with our consultants, the partners, uh, and our, our panelists today. We want to build upon the community that we have started through these uh, Workforce Wednesdays, and we welcome your engagement. I would also like to remind you that these webinars are recorded and available to view at any time via all of our social media channels, as well as CareerForceMN.com. Um, I'm sure someone will be popping some links in the chat there for you. You'll find all of our recordings, our previous recordings, resources, tons of information from this session, as well as previous sessions available for you there. All right, you can change the slide, James. Our team of consultants work regionally, which means that each consultant will have a slightly different way that they do their work based on the region and the employers that they're serving in that region. But the common core ways that we support, support our employers are identified here on this slide. We work with you to identify gaps in your current strategies, ensure that you're connected with your local, regional, and state workforce partners, and we assist you in building strategies that will help keep, um, attract and retain workforce. When you work with us, you're automatically connected to a wide network of people and partners who work collaboratively for the success of our state, our regions, our communities, so that your business and our workforce can thrive. We do not do this work alone. It takes many people to bring success to these efforts, and a lot of these people are in this session um, with us today, which is why chat's great, because there's connections that can be made and our partners and, and other people that are doing really awesome things out there can share information uh, with you. And finally, we really do want to learn more about you. So please, if you haven't already, introduce yourself in the chat and tell us your name, title, anything that you uh, want us to know, as well as maybe pop in something that you're most interested in learning about um, with our upcoming talent pools today. I know we have a super packed agenda, so we're just gonna dive right in. I would love to introduce you to Jessica O'Brien, who is our Southeast Workforce Strategy Consultant. Go ahead, Jess. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jessica O'Brien. I'm the Workforce Strategy Consultant in Southeast Minnesota. And we really appreciate you joining us today for this extended panel discussion. Um, we have a fabulous group of panelists. Um, we do have a larger panel um, today that, um, and like Jess said, we are extending this time. We have a panel that incorporates youth voice and features um, 
programs with intentionality around a supportive culture for youth and also highlights some data and research trends that give us some interesting perspective on youth identity development and also post high school um, employment patterns. And so uh, we will be devoting the next hour and a half uh, primarily to our panelists, but we do hope to have a little bit of time at the end for maybe a couple of questions. So we do encourage you to um, share your comments and your questions in the chat, and then feel free to upvote the questions that you agree with with other people with the thumbs up um, to help us uh, see what questions um, are bubbling up. So we will try to get to a couple questions at the end. A quick overview of who our panelists um, are today, and they're each going to be introducing themselves and talking a little bit more about uh, who they are and the work they do. We have uh, Cadence Nunn from Story Arc and the band Nunn Above the, um, in the video that you saw when you were coming in. We have Stephanie Atkins from Story Arc. She'll be sharing about the emerging uh, their emerging professionals program. We have Shania Youssef, a senior at Stillwater Area Public Schools. We have Eric Anderson from Stillwater Area Public Schools, and he'll be sharing about their Grow Your Own program. We have Casey Craig from Federated Insurance, and she'll be sharing about their internship program. We have Dr. Misun Borman from Mayo Clinic, and she will be sharing about the P-TECH program. And we have Dr. Stephanie Bowman, who is a consultant from Bowman Cons uh, Consultation, and she'll be sharing about developing identities and organizational culture. And then after our panelists have shared some of their slides with us, we'll have a data presentation from Orion Casal, who is the Assistant Director of the Labor Market Information Office with DEED. And she will be shining a light on some patterns of employment post high school and what industries have been uh, successful in recruiting our younger colleagues. So um, now with that, we're gonna go ahead and start with um, our first panelist who was featured in the video that you saw when you were joining in, Cadence Nunn. So Cadence Nunn is a recent college graduate from Concordia University in St. Paul, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology of May in May of 22. Cadence currently works full time in a full-time capacity with students as a creative writing mentor and has a passion for advocacy and empowering student leadership in her role as Ambassador of Youth Development and Communications for Story Arc. Um, Cadence is also the lead, lead singer and bassist for her sibling band, None Above, with whom she performed on America's Got Talent in season 13. None Above has performed with the three-time Grammy award-winning group, Sounds of Blackness, and shared the stage with another talented family group, The Steels. They have been hired for numerous corporate performances, including Children's Cancer Research Fund and General Mills MLK Breakfast. They have also performed at public venues like the Dakota Crooners and the Minnesota State Fair. And so we truly appreciate Cadence joining us, and we've asked her to share a little bit about herself using the four P's framework here about her passion, partnerships, personal and profession. And so welcome, Cadence. I'll hand things over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Jessica. My name is Cadence Nunn, and just a little bit about myself. Some of my passions are in self-discovery. I think it's really, really important to just get in tune with who we are as people. I love creating music. I love singing. It's, it's what I do, and as well as performing. I love performing specifically with my siblings. Um, and something that recently has become very important to me is building authentic relationships, especially being a recent college graduate. It's kind of difficult to get out there and make some friends. So building authentic relationships is very important. Some personal motivators for me are, of course, my family and friends, as well as my faith community. And in partnership with others, I'm really good with honesty. I believe that some of my uh, most of my critiques are kind of straight to the point. I'm good at problem solving and communication is a strength of mine as well. And I enjoy creating and looking for innovative solutions. Um, in my profession, as Jessica mentioned, I work with Story Arc. Uh, I mentor and tutor students in creative writing. We also added a um, music camp to our summer programming. So I'll be mentoring students in music as well this summer. 
I'm in love with amplifying student voice. And as far as the music industry goes, I, at some point, hope to break into the music industry and find a professional outlet for my music. So that's just a little bit about me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cadence. We really appreciate you being a part of this panel. Uh, next, we'll hear from Stephanie Atkins from StoryArk. Uh, Stephanie is a founder and executive director of StoryArk, a nonprofit that empowers, uplifts, and amplifies the voices of youth through the art of storytelling. Alongside StoryArk's emerging professionals, Ms. Adkins leads team building activities for corporations wishing to cultivate a supportive workplace for diverse staff. As an artist, Ms. Adkins works on literary arts projects that are realized on multiple media. She's also the publisher for Summer Snow Publications and writes multimedia serial stories under the name S.C. Helene. She has been a speaker at, a local, at local and regional events and presented a TEDx talk titled World in Uproar, How Stories, Not Facts, Will Save the Day. So welcome, Stephanie, and I will hand things over to you to share about your Emerging Professionals program. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessica. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me before I get started. Is yes. there anyone who can't? Because I can speak really loud if I need to. Um, but would, is, is everyone good? Yep, we can hear you. Great. All right. Well, uh, like Jessica said, at Story Arc, we empower, uplift, and amplify youth voices. And we do that in part by helping students create, um, well, join in to collaborative teams where they create original stories through podcasts, film, poetry, music, literary arts, basically, you know, any way you can tell a story, uh, we like to go alongside them to empower them to do that. It's really fun to be able to be a part of this work because the power of story to be transformational, not only for the individual is really apparent, but also just how it can build empathy and understanding in the audience is really gratifying with the work that we do in empowering youth voice. Since the very, very, very beginning of Story Arc, we have been student initiated, student led. Um, we don't do anything unless it's been a part of a student desire to participate and to become a part of it. And if we can switch to slide two, James, um, that would be fantastic because what I'd like to share with you is how out of the student initiated student led process our emerging professional program was born and essentially um, we serve a wide variety of youth from all different backgrounds all different communities all different faiths all different perspectives and so it's really important to us that our students that we serve are represented by the people who serve them and the emerging professional was really the program was really born out of that where we hire our participants um, our alumni who have participated in story art programming to become what we call emerging professionals and it's uh, the emerging professionals along with emerging professionals who are now promoted to program directors who work with the story art staff to plan, to implement, design, uh, and make sure that our programming is really fulfilling the needs of the students and empowering, uplifting, and amplifying youth voices as our mission is so vital to our mission. Um, so what's really wonderful about that is for us with training, we are always pouring in, pouring in, pouring in to our youth. And because we hire past participants, they already know our mission, they understand it, and they know the importance of the student initiated piece of it, which, you know, it's really easy as adults to come on in and say, this is how you have to do it. Oh, let me tell you, let me share with all the wonderful things we've done. But no, that's not what we want at all. We really want the students to be involved in it and for them to be the ones that, um, empowered to create their stories in the way they want to do that. So hopefully, you know, we're always pouring into our participants and then they are growing in their leadership skills such that they then pour into the new participants. And we have, as you see, that, you know, stair step ladder that goes on up. Um, I will tell you, and James, again, if you can move forward to the next slide, that would be fantastic. I will tell you that as we've grown and as we've built up our workforce, so to speak, 
that, at least for me personally, I've learned a lot of things along the way, mainly that the way maybe I participated in the workforce in the last couple of decades is not the way that necessarily meets the needs of the youth that we serve, because it is a very, as we all know, you know, post pandemic and post so many things going on in this world, it's a really different world that we live in now than maybe when I entered the workforce. And so some of the things that the youth have helped us realize as we bring them into our workforce and on staff, either as an emerging professional, uh, a, a PD or on full-time staff is that we really want to walk alongside them to communicate in the way that's effective to communicate with them. Um, used to be email. Uh, it's now other ways, you know, texting, Slack, um, remind, et cetera. But also we need to be flexible and adaptable. Our paid time off now, they just, however they need to use it is how they use it. And then also just making no assumptions because uh, there might be things that we assume that are not true for them. And so always being curious and asking, tell me more questions to understand where they're coming from and how we can pour into them to build an effective staff is really important. So that's what I have. Hopefully I haven't gone over my five minutes. Uh, awesome. It's really great to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to connect with so many amazing individuals on this call. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of the things that you just talked about um, during our panel questions. So thank you. All right, so um, next I'm excited to introduce you all to Shania Youssef, who is currently a senior at Stillwater, Stillwater Area Public Schools. Her family is from Egypt and she is currently a full-time post-secondary enrollment options student at the University of Minnesota studying pre-med. Uh, Mr. A from Stillwater Public Schools, who's also a fellow panelist, um, reflects on Shania's many great qualities and states, Shania is rare for someone her age and her ability to see the limitless potential in all of those around her, including the summer success scholars she serves, her family, her teachers, and her colleagues and friends. Shania possesses a strong sense of integrity and shows up in the world carrying herself with a humble confidence while, while always remaining open and approachable to others. And so now I will hand things over to Shania and invite you uh, to share a little bit about yourself using the four Ps, passion, partnerships, personal and profession. And so welcome Shania. And also you are you are streaming in from the University of Minnesota between your classes. Yes. So, so thank you for that and welcome. Thank you for that uh, sweet introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, some of my passions are uh, my education. I, feel really privileged to have the public education opportunities I have today, especially from an immigrant family. And I'm proud to be a uh, incoming first generation college student. Uh, I love my coursework and I love learning things such as humanities and, and the sciences like cellular biology. And research is a big part of my life. I worked um, on oncology research last summer and it's just a way to grow and learn about the processes behind, you know, how we do things like get vaccines or medications, but also learn more about the sciences and get a hands-on experience. So um, a story where I feel like I made a difference for my personal section was when I founded the first medical club at my high school. And that was a very big moment for me because I feel like I was able to create a community where pre-med students could kind of meet and interact with each other and kind of alleviate some of the difficulties that come with this uh, great calling and an amazing profession. And the club is called HOSA. A lot of information is available for it online. And some of the leadership qualities that I think I bring are being dependable and innovative as well as networking. I love meeting new professors, teachers, uh, even working with Jessica has been such a blessing and amplifying 
uh, other voices is really important to me, especially those that are not heard as often. And profession, as Jessica mentioned, I am pre-med, uh, motivated by some of my personal experiences, like my family's experiences with healthcare and their limited English, and kind of navigating that, as well as uh, some medical exposure, uh, like shadowing that has really shown me the critical thinking process of a doctor and how important that is. And I hope to become a part of making our medical workforce more representative of the population as a whole. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Shania. And there's no doubt that you have great things ahead in your future, um, in your medical uh, career. So I wouldn't be surprised if you get a couple emails from some of the folks listening today. Uh, so thank you so much for that. All right, so next we'll hear from Eric Anderson with Stillwater Area Public Schools, or Mr. A, as uh, Shania refers uh, to him. Um, so Eric has been a licensed school counselor collaborating with students and families in, a public in public education for 25 years. Under Eric's leadership in his current role as the coordinator of Stillwater Area Public Schools Office of Equity and Integration, his office received the Building Bridges Award from the Islamic Resource Group in recognition of Eric's work to build bridges among Muslim Americans and the broader community. Eric supports culturally in inclusive professional development for district staff, family and community engagement, college and career readiness pathways, cooperative and experiential student learning, and grow your own educator programming specifically focused on black indigenous people of color student leaders. So welcome Eric, and I will hand things over to you to share about the Grow Your Own program. Wonderful. <clears throat> Excited and honored to do so. Can you go to the next slide? So a couple of things, as um, Jessica said, this is my 25th year in public education. I think it's the most worthy of all professions, and I'm still zealously and enthusiastically excited to come to work every day. Um, a bit of a story, um, statewide, about 32.5% of our students are students of color, and only 5.9% of our teachers are teachers of color. And so what that means in a district like Stillwater Area Public Schools is we have amazing BIPOC student leaders like Shania who may matriculate through our entire system 13 years without ever seeing someone that looks like them in that um, leadership position. So we've got a lot, lot of work to do in Stillwater and a lot of work to do in the state of Minnesota. So one of the ways that we're approaching narrowing that opportunity gap is through grow your own programming. And so um, we begin this programming with a philosophic ideal around authentically incorporating student voice and it's simply nothing about us without us. And I'll get into the details of the programming in a minute, but what we really pride ourselves on doing in this program is treating our student leaders as colleagues. They're not simply there to help out, but we're really trying to immerse them in public education. And a really great example of this is um, during the summer of 2020, we had to do our summer school virtually. And as we were doing the preparation for summer school programming, we had the adults in the space and we had our, our student leaders or colleagues in the space. And an innovative idea would come out and oftentimes the adults would say, oh, oh, we can't do that. And our student leaders would say, oh yes, we can. And here's how, because that generation brings in a level of tech savvy that oftentimes educators of my my generation don't have. And so it was really wonderful to see the shift where they were really taking the lead in the learning. So if you could shift to the next slide, please. So again, the, the, the purpose of Grow Your Own is to narrow opportunity and exposure gaps. So it's a teacher preparation strategy focusing on, focusing on developing and retaining which is really important for all of you in the workforce as well. When we're successful in hiring staff of color, 
what are the intentional systems and structures that we have in place to ensure that we retain them? So Grow Your Own is used to address teacher shortages and increase diversity of the teacher workforce. Next slide, please. So the way we go about it in Stillwater Area Public Schools is we have a four-pronged approach. The first is around recruitment and Stillwater has a program called AVID, which stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. And about 60% of those students are BIPOC students. So that is kind of our target market where we go and talk to those kids about, are you interested in the teaching profession? So we identify 40 student leaders each summer and we pay them a thousand dollar stipend. We've written a grant, we have some categorical funding so we're able to pay them because what we found in the early years when the programming was volunteer, we were creating a forced choice. Students had to decide, am I going to take that summer job? I need to save money for college, you know, or am I going to do this month long volunteer program? And so we now are able to pay them. And then what happens is they engage in two days of professional development with our teachers. They're assigned to a grade level team. Then they do eight hours of curriculum writing with that grade level team. So they get what we call insiders eyes into all the behind the scenes things that happen. You know, when our teachers are delivering classroom instruction. They spend the month of July with our elementary kindergarten through fifth grade summer school scholars. And then when they come back in the fall as this uh, career tree shows, we have a partnership with Century College. So these students are able to come back to our high school, take this course called an introduction to the teaching profession, get again insiders eyes into the academic component at the post-secondary level of what it means to be a teacher um, and get college credit for it. So next slide, please. And finally, I just want to, you know, how does all of this apply to you if you're not in the education profession? And I think one of the things we see here within our school districts statewide and across the country is the idea that successful multinational corporations that um, to increase creativity and innovation need to be able to recognize, incorporate, and leverage divergent thinking and perspectives. So a lot of times what predominantly white institutions like Stillwater do is we will hire staff of color, but then we're expecting them simply to assimilate to the dominant cultural paradigm versus engaging in an institutional process of what we call mutual adaptation. So this is some research from uh, two researchers, Di Stefano and Mastavesky, um, and they talk about, you know, as, as if we ignore and suppress cultural differences, the performance of, of teams is very predictable and it tends to be on the lower end of the continuum. But again, as we learn to recognize, incorporate and leverage um, that, you know, performance improves. So, so that's our ultimate game. This is the sixth year that we've been doing the Grow Your Own programming and finally, our team had the honor and privilege of going out to Orlando, Florida and presenting the work um, to the AVID National Conference. So we're, we're always collaborating with other districts and getting their ideas in terms of how they're doing it so we can adapt our programming and, and do even better. Thank you so much, Eric. And I, I, I know that when you and I chatted, you said you also had talked about how uh, people going through the Grow Your Own program are going into other in, you know, other types of work besides teaching, like Shania, for example, is going pre-med and how I think you had said, um, you know, in, in a leadership role, you're going to teach, right? So there's some skills around that, some transferable skills. Yeah, the, the school counseling paradigm has changed dramatically in 25 years. It used to be we'd bring in our juniors and seniors and kind of ask them, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? That paradigm really doesn't exist anymore. Now we kind of refer to it as what I call a guided drift. So we want to have a sense, you know, 
of big buckets? Are you interested in math and science? Are you interested in the humanities? And now how can we provide lived experiences to let you delve deeper into those interest areas and let's see where it takes our young folks, so. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Casey Craig from Federated Insurance. Uh, Casey has been working for Federated Insurance for over seven years, where she has held a variety of positions, including customer service, training, supervising, and leading a team, and in her current role as recruiter, where she oversees the coordination of Federated's high school internship program located in their home office location of Owatonna, Minnesota. And Federated's high school internship program focuses on exposing students to real life work relationships and responsibility in the workplace while allowing the grace in learning to do so professionally. Love that. Those um, Through support from various mentors along the way, Federated provides a safe space to help students define their work and impact students as they grow beyond high school. So welcome, Casey, and I will hand it over to you to share about your internship program. Awesome, thanks Jessica. I'm excited to be here today representing Federated and to talk a little bit about the internship program that I have the pleasure of coordinating um, involving our high school students in the communities in which Federated employees live and work. Um, if we go over to the next slide, you'll see that um, we're sharing Federated has been do, um, hosting interns in our Owatonna office since 2018, expanding that to our new office in Mankato in 2021. Um, one of our cornerstones at Federated is investing in the communities in which our employees live and work. And so what that means to us is we focus on building that next generation, that next generation of successful employees, successful leaders, and success at Federated. Um, at the end of the day, we're, we're here to benefit our clients. And so how can we do that while investing in our communities and the youth of Minnesota? So why high schoolers? It's it's been heard or in a lot of discussions that businesses struggle to find what that benefit is to bringing high school students into the business. Well, we have found that um, not only is it exciting to watch them learn and grow and develop, it's also created a lot of benefits for our leaders here and sharpening their skills as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that has meant to us, but to get this started, it's really founded in our partnerships with the schools. Um, Owatonna High School and the Mankato High School. We've got partnerships with our guidance counselors like Mr. A who just spoke, um, business instructors and teachers in the school. Both of our the high schools that we work with offer a class for students where they can enroll in that and then go get real life experience, which our internship program happens to fall in. We also work really closely with our workforce coordinator, um, Megan, who's done a great job of helping us get into other um, schools. So not just our high school, but we also have had students from like the Alternative Learning Center and surrounding areas within the counties in which we um, are located as well. So it's just broadened that base of students as well. So during the internship at Federated, our students can expect a couple of things. They can expect a real life interview process. So these classes also help them prepare for resume writing and interviewing. And so they get um, an opportunity to put ex exercise that learning and put it to use in a pretty safe environment. Um, we request that resumes and we have an official interview, but it's it's filled with um, soft feedback as well along the way. So when, when they're coming in to interview, they're getting that experience, but they're also getting some coaching along the way before they're, they come in the door to start that job. Um, they also get to experience what a live offer sounds like and depending on their age, go through some of those steps such as like a background test or or um, screening that that needs to happen as well. So it's it's a really great experience that they um, have before jumping into the, the workforce. When they're here in the in the, their position, they experience some really great support. So they've got um, a supervisor who they're assigned do, depending on the type of work or the area that they're interning in. They've got on-floor mentors who help them with the training and daily support, checking in and making sure things are going okay, really getting those connections throughout the business. And then they get me um, as the program coordinator. So I'm checking in throughout the, the internship. The, it's the duration of a semester, um, checking in every other week, um, 
and just seeing how things are going, seeing what they need from me to make sure that they're getting the experience that they hoped for from a business setting. And then also during the internship, they get business exposure. So they come in, let's say that they're working in a customer service type role. They, If they're also interested in what processing would look like, some data entry or even some underwriting, some deeper dive into um, what policies look like for insurance, they can go job shadow and make those different connections. So they're also leaving the internship with some um, connections and mentors that they can be connecting with along the way after their internship has ended. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about the student benefits and the growth. So at the end of their internship, they get to give a final presentation. So not only are they getting some additional exposure to meetings and deadlines and things like that in the workplace, but they are sharing with our leadership at Federated what they experience. So it's a really rich environment where we're getting some pretty great feedback, some live in the moment feedback as to what our culture looks and feels like from youth. Um, how can we do better? How can we support them? And what is working well? Um, they And tied into that is they're experiencing this internship with quite a bit of grace. So we keep in mind that these are high school students who are coming in. They've never written professional emails. They've never made um, phone calls to or likely haven't made phone calls to customers. Um, we're building their confidence. They are coming in from a, a student experience in a school where they are coming in and working alongside adults. That can be really scary at 17 or 18 years old. Um, they also are expected to come in and, and wear their professional dress and so um, interacting with the staff professionally. And so there's there's oftentimes just some coaching and it's it's a really rich experience for both sides of the spectrum. And then the benefits for Federated, the, the numbers speak for themselves. We've hired 13 of the 29 interns that we've hosted. Um, 13, or sorry, six of those 13s have been promoted with Federated and have been working here and thriving in our culture. Um, and also we're just excited that nearly half of our interns have been BIPOC students as well. So it has just been a really rich environment and experience um, for both Federated and the communities. Thank you so much, Casey, and I really especially appreciate the real life experience with Grace. That's a, I really like that component. Thank you so much. OK, next we're going to hear from another business um, and we're going to hear from Dr. Misan Borman with Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Borman is the HR Director of Workforce Development with Mayo Clinic. She has 10 years in of experience in workforce development initiatives and over 20 years in various professional settings, including K-12 and higher education. She is passionate about collaborative leadership, developing relationships, leveraging innovations to address systems challenges, and using data to drive decisions. So welcome, welcome Misan, and I will um, hand things over to you to share about your P-TECH program. Thanks, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. So I thought I would start out with us just taking a minute to reflect on where our economic environment is at currently. And so I'm going to ask, and we'll see which of you are up to date on your numbers. Go ahead and put in the chat, what percent of our workforce by 2030 do you think will be Gen Z? And so just a reminder, Gen Z are those that are currently ages 11 to 26. So I just am curious, like if people have a sense of what percent of our workforce will be Gen Z um, by 2030? Any 46? Okay. Oh, so I do see a 30. So Bong, you're correct. You're the first one. I wish I had a prize. Um, but 30% of our workforce by 2030 will be Gen Z. And then with that, by 2030, we're gonna have baby boomers who currently make up our 25% um, of our workforce be 65 or older. So it almost becomes like the perfect storm of this like crossing of our aging booming population to our emerging next generation of our workforce. And the reason I share that with you, especially employers on this call, is because it's absolutely imperative for us as employers to be thinking now, if we haven't already, what is our workforce development strategy around young talent? Because if we're not doing something now, um, we're definitely gonna be in even more of a critical crisis situation by 2030. Um, so to start, I will go ahead, Jessica, next slide. 
Jessica invited me to share a little bit about PTAC, and I'm going to be fully transparent. PTAC is really um, nothing that mail code owns. It's actually Rochester Public Schools um, that owns that program. But the model is really unique in the sense that it has an employer working alongside um, the school. PTAC was actually started by IBM, I think it was over 20 years ago. It actually stands for Pathways in Technology Early College High School. And the goal of PTAC was really to have students not only graduate with their high school diploma, but also walk across that stage with some sort of certification or degree originally in the IT space. But what we have done here in Southern Minnesota is taken that PTEC model in partnership with Rochester Public Schools, RCTC and IBM, and created two pathway options for students. So students can choose the IT pathway or they can choose the healthcare pathway. And right now, because this is so new, the healthcare pathway is specific to our licensed practice, practical nursing option. Um, the unique thing about PTEC is that number one, the Rochester Public Schools is talking to students when they're in middle school. And so in their eighth grade year, they would be applying to the PTEC program. It's like a school within a school. And they're really targeting BIPOC students, students that qualify for free and reduced lunch. And as those students are admitted into the program starting in ninth grade, they are given additional wraparound services, tutoring services, um, separate sections of some of their core classes. And then they have career counseling that's much more in depth than probably the average high school student would receive. And then the exciting part is as employer partners, IBM and Mayo Clinic, we are working alongside the course curriculum to ensure that we are integrating work-based learning experiences and activities. And that is really important because as employers, we have an opportunity to help inspire and motivate the youth, right? Learning becomes not static sitting in a classroom, but it becomes an experience. It becomes a way to engage the youth. And so while we are still in the early stages, um, this last fall was just the second um, year of the program. Um, we're very excited at what we're seeing as an employer partner. Um, ninth, 10th grade, it's really focused on what I call those early career exploration activities, group mentorships, site visits, sending guests classroom speakers, right? And then as they go through the, um, the um, program, as they get into their upper um, years, we will be working with Rochester Public Schools to create more intense work-based learning experiences. So that might be uh, career observations. It would be more one-on-one -on -one mentorships. And then it would also be creating a paid internship experience for students so that they can actually be in the workplace. And I think Dr. A had talked about it earlier that you know, you don't want students to have to choose between like, I really need to make some money to help my family to, you know, save for my future uh, versus a learning opportunity that's considered, quote, an enrichment, right, optional kind of thing. So we're really trying to work out how do we best work with the PTEC program to ensure the students are getting what they need to make the learning as relevant as possible. Um, the other part about PTEC that's really interesting and I think very innovative is that we as employer partners have direct influence on the curriculum. So we have staff that sit as part of the steering committee um, and then the steering committee has a subcommittee that focuses on the healthcare pathway. Um, we're actually starting some preliminary conversations of how we're going to build out additional options outside of practical nursing. Because as you can imagine in healthcare, there's so many more roles outside of nursing that we want our students to be aware of. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to have to take away from the existing cohort of students and basically water that down. We really want to see the actual enrollment of students in that program greater. Um, the program is funded by um, the state of Minnesota through state appropriated funds. So in order for us to grow the, um, the next cohorts, we know that we're gonna have to figure out a way to fund those additional teachers and the wraparound services. And then you can see some of those employer commitments on your screen. So go ahead, Jessica, next slide. Or James, I'm sorry. So I had thought I got my PTEC slide all done and then Jessica emailed me and said, oh, you have a few more minutes. I was like, oh, like what else could I add um, just to kind of enhance 
um, knowledge for this group. And so what I wanted to share was that PTEC really is part of our larger strategic work that we're doing here at Mayo Clinic to develop our future workforce. So the slide that you're seeing is actually from our 2022 impact report. And, you know, the numbers, you know, especially for smaller organizations may be like, wow, that is amazing. The reality is what you're seeing is actually taken very limited resources. Uh, we were able to reach over 146 high schools and 145 college universities um, because with the high school tactic, we really just tried to get into the classroom and we try to be at the community events like career fairs and job fairs. With our college Ooh. university work, most of that actually came from a series of webinars that we had um, pushed out. And we saw that there was significant interest by undergraduate college students and learning more about career opportunities at Mayo Clinic. Um, because this is less resource heavy, um, I feel like this is something that really any employer, no matter how big or small, could really explore. Um, you can see just through our college webinar series that we were able to hire 32 individuals, very talented individuals into our organization to fill some of those absolutely critical needs that we have. And because our career webinars showed such great promise, we're actually implementing in 20 or this year, this spring actually, um, a webinar series for high school students, parents, and educators. And we actually have one coming up April 26th. And Jessica, just remind me, I will send you the flyer and then you can send it out to all those that attended um, today so then they can see and join in if they're interested. Absolutely, we can put that on our website when this Perfect. with this video, yep. Um, so then my uh, final slide. So mentorship, as we all know, is it's been around for a while. Research has said it's very, very effective, especially with um, BIPOC students. And so while we know it's very effective, what I have learned is that um, there's things that we could do to improve it. So I tell my team, like, we're going to work on mentorship 2.0. And so while we know that, you know, we have staff, employees that are more than happy to mentor and guide students. What we're learning is that sometimes that relationship is a little awkward. Most mentorship models, they really want the mentee to kind of initiate and lead that relationship. And so again, because this is younger populations, sometimes populations, BIPOC populations are ones that, you know, need more affirmation and confidence building. And so we're looking at doing it in a way that's more mentor led. And we know our mentors are extremely busy. They're full-time professionals. They wear multiple hats. And so we're looking and developing some what I call easy to use curriculum for mentors to be able to pull and guide discussions when they connect with their mentees. Um, we also realize that to find volunteers is extremely challenging. You know, mentorship is not something that we pay our staff to do. So we rely on their goodwill to want to pay it forward. And so we are, you know, thinking through some innovative tactics to create um, more incentive or motivation for our staff to engage in mentorship relationships. Um, everything from working with our internal volunteer services to providing CEUs um, through various departments. Uh, but at the end of the day, we know that we can't do this without staff support. And so um, I will be able to report back to you hopefully a year from now where things are at, but um, we do feel like with some of these just little enhancements that we're gonna be able to take our mentorships to the next level. And that oh. is what I have, Jessica. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Misun. And I think the mentorship component is one that we hear a lot that there is, it's a, it's a component that um, helps when there's a bigger investment and when people can be creative and it helps to foster that belonging as well. So thank you so much. Um, we are now going to hear, last but not least, from our consultant who's joined us today, Dr. Stephanie Bowman. Uh, Dr. Bowman is uh, the founder of Bowman Consulting. She's also the director of the Center for Student Success at Winona State University, where she leads a team to remove boundaries for college students while creating opportunities for developmental and educational growth. Dr. Bowman believes that equity systems change is possible through open communication, vulner vulnerability, and a lot of work. And she joins us with a little friend as well. Welcome. Yes, I do. Thank you. 
Um, so hello everyone and thank you for having me on this morning. I want to talk with you all specifically about the importance of understanding the developing mind when working with our Gen Z colleagues. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, yep, my name is Dr. Bowman. I use she, her, hers pronouns and through my various degrees, I have acquired a lot of knowledge on human development theories, organizational theories, equity and inclusion practices, as well as acculturation theories. Um, when I was doing my dissertation, I focused on the lived experience of a Latino teacher candidate, both while he attended a Grow Your Own program, as well as now being a new teacher. And while I was looking at that and reflecting, I started to realize that our Gen Z colleagues, what they need and want in organizations is not being met. This is not because organizations are refusing to meet those needs, but just a general lack of awareness of what are those needs. Therefore, I want to congr congratulate every one of you for joining us online because you're really taking the first step, which is awareness, right? And we can't do anything if we don't know. I also have a lot of experience running a multi-generational team. Um, I have everywhere from our Gen Z staff up to um, folks who have retired two, three times in the last time and are doing part-time work with us. Um, and so my office works to ensure, you know, I really want to make sure that we're doing a conductive work environment for all. And spoiler alert, a one-size-fits-all approach is not the answer when doing a multi-generational work. Um, next slide, please. So I have an oversimplified data point here regarding our prefrontal cortex, right? It, neuroscience is so important and so complicating, and I'm not going to get it done in five minutes, but our prefrontal cortex is up here and it assists the human with decision making skills, managing our behaviors in both social and private situations. And lastly, the prefrontal cortex works with complex thinking and problem solving. The prefrontal cortex begins to develop at the age seven and eight. So if you have a toddler, I also have a toddler, but a baby and you're like, what is happening at the grocery store today? Yeah, not there yet. Can't manage this. Um, but we're fully developed by the age of 25 to 26. At this moment, um, our oldest Gen Z's are 26. Therefore, many of our Gen Z colleagues are in that final stages of developing their prefrontal cortex. This is not a negative, nor is it a positive statement. It's just a fact. It is something that we have all, if you've made it past the age of 26, we've all struggled through and gone through. Um, when we work with people who are still molding their own social identities and developing their prefrontal cortex, we as organizations need to take that opportunity to assist them through these two life, um, really life-changing stages. First, um, we need to create brave spaces to fail forward. I define a brave space as a space that is free from judgment, humiliation, and hostility. A brave space allows for errors and mistakes. A brave space invites vulnerability and transparency. This is what we need to do in order to allow people to fail forward. Failing forward is a tool that I use a lot when I work with our teacher candidates. It's not no, it's no, but yes, and right. How can we continue to move forward? And this can be seen through many different feedback strategies, and I'm sure you're using most of them. But really, we provide that person with tools and information in order to be successful. We might demonstrate the task. We allow that person to complete the task without assistance. If the task is unsuccessful, then we provide supplemental assistance or information in order for our folks to be building their confidence. People need to be able to complete the task on their own and know that if they are stuck or have made a mistake, it's going to be OK because they're in that brave space. Another piece of building a brave space is to create a pathway to success. Gen Z colleagues want to have a personal pathway to success. Not everyone wants to move up the corporate ladder. Pathways to success can include having a balanced work life, working from home, having a hybrid situation, being able to carry your little one while working, investing in professional development, 
all of our pathways to success need to be customizable for every employee and it needs to be honored. You can't just write one and then disregard it. You need to honor it. The second piece is developing your organizational culture. We want to talk about lived and espoused values, right? Do you only have espoused values? It means you have nice words on your website, but none of it is in practice. Our Gen C folks are incredibly perceptive and they will see right through that. They need to be able to feel that what you have on your website is actually what is happening in the organization. Second, I really believe in the importance of creating micro influencers. So this is, you know, we're talking about um, folks here, a lot of it, you basically have focused on micro influencers. So these are people who really care about your organization and want to see growth and improvement of the organization. So they're willing to provide a system um, information. So they'll be in charge of onboarding new staff as well as creating streamlined communication if changes need to be made in the organization. They need to be paid for this job responsibility and they need to be listened to. Lastly, we need to do an inventory of our own social identity development. Um, some of our older generation, some of us who have been in this world much longer, have not had time to invest in who we are as people, and that shows up um, sometimes negatively. So we need to ask ourselves, who are we as people? What are our social identities? How are we showing up in the workplace? How do I show up in a classroom? How do I show up um, at the lunch table? How do I show up in the parking lot? All of this requires work. Um, and so we need to ask ourselves, how much work are we willing to invest to make the changes needed to improve this organization? That's kind of all I have for you. Um, I want to thank you all for listening. And honestly, if you want to work together or you have any questions, feel free to email me. And I'll take it right back to you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. And I think the micro influencers as a strategy is a very intriguing concept. So I really appreciate um, all of your points and especially that idea as a strategy. Um, so now that we've heard some different perspectives uh, around important considerations with engaging our younger colleagues, uh, we're going to hear now from Orion Casal, who is our Assistant Director of Labor Market Information Office at DEED. And she's going to highlight some of the patterns from the Minnesota Statewide Longitudinal, Longitudinal Education Data System, or otherwise known as SLEDS, um, that tracks student data from pre-kindergarten through the completion of post-secondary education and then on into the workforce. And so I do want to invite, uh, because Orion will be um, staying throughout the rest of our time together, that if you have specific questions about the data, uh, put those in the chat and then she will try to communicate um, with you directly in the chat about your questions when she's done. So um, so over to you, Orian. Welcome. Hey, thank you, Jessica. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, yes, as Jessica said, I'm going to provide some background on youth in Minnesota's labor market um, to help frame the conversation today. So you can advance the slide. So Generation Z, the dark blue slice, is a small but critically important group of workers in Minnesota. As older workers age out of the workforce into retirement, Gen Z is aging into the workforce. By 2030, the share of Generation Z workers will grow almost double, as Misa mentioned, um, as more come into the workforce after graduating high school and college. You can advance the slide. So the next few slides um, use the SLEDS data to look at labor market outcomes for high school and college graduates following graduation. Looking at 2021 um, high school graduates, 61% are enrolled in college and 26% are primarily employed and not enrolled in college. So that green bar is the share who are not enrolled in college. And you can advance the slide. So focusing um, first on that green bar, so those uh, high school graduates who graduate and don't go to college, but instead primarily are engaged in work, 
Um, the vast majority of them were working part time hours during the four quarters following graduation. So um, like half of 2021 and half of 2022. 71% um, were working only 20 hours or less on average during that period. And 22% were working 21 to 29 hours per week on average. Only 7% of this group was working close to full time or clearly moving towards full time work. So I, I think the, the main point really of this slide is that um, high school graduates directly coming out of high school, not going on to college, are really an undertapped resource um, for, for workforce right now. Um, and in a tight labor market, it really makes sense for some employers um, to to more directly um, and intensively engage with this uh, potential workforce. And the next slide um, talks a little bit more about what what these workers um, coming out of high school are 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 doing, um, where they're working. And again, we're only talking about that year after high school um, at the moment. So the largest group worked in trade, transportation, and utilities, which includes both retail trade, driving, and warehouse um, occupations. At $16.03 per hour on average, wages were about, um, were about around average for these graduates. So for this group of, of workers, um, their average wage was someplace around $16 an hour. Leisure and hospitality came in second, followed by education and healthcare and professional and business services. The professional and business service sector includes temp, temp help, janitorial, um, landscaping, and security services, among others. The highest wages were found in professional and business services, manufacturing, construction, mining, and financial activities, but um, only about 20% of workers were, were working in these um, higher wage uh, industries. And when I, when I say higher wage, I mean higher wage for this group. Clearly, this group of high school graduates could be very productive in these sectors of the economy, earning fairly, you know, very, you know, wages that really show that they were moving into a career track. Um, so, you know, based on these, based on this uh, table, um, you know, my takeaway is that industries like construction, manufacturing, financial activities re really could benefit from um, engaging with this uh, group of workers more directly and, um, and, you know, actively recruiting and training these graduates. It's not only going to benefit the graduates themselves who can move directly into onto a career track, but also really benefit these 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 um, employers. Uh, you can go ahead and on to the next slide. So now we're going to move on to that 60 plus percent of uh, high school graduates in 2021. Well, it's not in 2021, but about the 60 percent of high school graduates who go in go on to college right after graduation. But we're going to back up a little bit and look at this graph looks at associate degree graduates um, from 2018 and what their employment outcomes were 24 months after graduation. And actually, this data will be updated very, very shortly, but unfortunately, I don't have that update yet. Um, but across the state, the vast majority of these graduates, over 30%, are working in healthcare during the second year after graduation. Many of the occupations in this industry that require licenses or certifications can be attained with an associate's degree or less, including registered nurse and LPN. This is a this is really um, this is excellent both for the graduates who can start a career after two-year investment in college, um, and also for the industry which can maintain a robust pipeline of qualified workers. Um, this industry offers the highest median wage outcomes um, of these seven industries that are displayed on the graph um, at $25.40 an hour. And then moving on to the next graph, um, which shows bachelor's degree graduates, same time frame. Um, again, healthcare absorbed the largest share of any industry sector um, of these graduates and offers the highest wages um, 
in that 24 month period after graduation. So right at the very beginning of a career. However, these graduates are spread um, across sectors a little more evenly based on their education concentration. Um, so among, so just going, uh, flipping this on its head a little bit and looking at what graduates, what um, college BA or BS graduates graduated with, 20% uh, of bachelor's degrees were awarded in healthcare fields, 15% in business, 10% in education, 4% in computer and information sciences, and 4% in biology, uh, in biology and med and biomedical sciences, and then 2.3% in engineering. I mean, I could go on, but those are, I think, some that um, employers on this uh, conference might be interested in. Um, and uh, this was so all graduates within Minnesota of any college, you know, BA, BS program um, in public and private colleges. So that um, you can go on to the next slide. That is um, sort of a very big picture look at where our high school and college graduates end up right after graduation. Um, you know, you can trace these these graduates out further um, and find out things like how does their career progress over time? I, I don't have time to do that today, but that is also a very interesting uh, thing to look at. Now I'm going to shift focus and look at those workers who were laid off during the 2020 pandemic recession. So this is a graph that shows um, of those 631,000 workers, it's <laughs> so a lot of people who were laid off in 2020 um, and went on to unemployment insurance as a result of the pandemic, um, what their labor market outcomes were two years later. Okay, so this is in 2022. Um, and this looks, this is a, a graph just by age. So uh, we, we can slice and dice this lots of different ways, but I'm only showing you the age um, breakout because that's, I think, what's most relevant for today. Um, younger workers were least likely to be recalled by their employer, and we know that from tracking them over time. So we tracked them in 2020 and 2021, 2022. Um, so they were least likely to be recalled by their employer following their layoff and most likely to switch industry to switch employers and switch industry sectors at some point over the next two years. Um, they were also the most mobile group with many in the gray bar likely moving out of state for work or or school. Um, for the most part, the older the worker, the more likely they were to be recalled and to stay with their original employer, and the less likely they were to switch employers or industries. And I could keep, I could talk about this study for a long time. This is a study that my colleague Alessia Lieber has been doing over time, tracking these workers um, back into the labor market. And um, there's, you know, we have uh, several articles um, in our trends publication uh, that provide a lot more detail than I'm providing today. But I do want to go on to another study um, in the next slide. Also, this is also research by Alessia Lieber. So this continues the theme of, of job switching. So who is switching employers? Um, but this is this is looking at the entire workforce. So it's not just that population of people who was laid off during the COVID recession. Um, this is everybody between 2020 uh, 20 and 2021, the fourth quarters of those years. Um, so this analysis compares those who switched employers and those who stayed with the same employer um, over that one year period, just as inflation, if you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about inflation um, when we talk about the economy lately. So this is just as inflation was really kicking into high gear. The green line represents the wages of job switchers. Uh, so the green line is job switchers and the blue line is job stayers. Um, and the, the um, Y bar is the median um, percent of real wage growth, so real wage growth. And then the, the, the horizontal bar is age of the worker. Okay, so con 
conclusions from this graph. Workers who switched employers saw better wage growth and were able to be inflation up to age 56. Um, workers who stayed with the same employer saw wages stagnate and real wages shrink by age 35. Youth, so at the left side of the horizontal axis, are more mobile and tend to move for higher pay. The jump in the green line at age 22, that bump, is college graduates moving into their first professional jobs. One thing that this graph does not show that I do want to point out is that um, one out of every three job switchers were low wage workers defined as earning less than $17.50 an hour. They switched employers far more often than the, than other workers and had the highest relative annual earnings growth. So they saw the biggest growth in wages from switching, indicating that they had an economic motive to switch. In general, this analysis, I think that the key takeaway from this analysis is that workers switch jobs in order to increase their wage and that younger workers are most likely to be the beneficiaries of switching. And so I would encourage anyone who's interested in this analysis to check out the article in our September 2022 issue of Trends. But kind of building on this um, analysis, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is actually from work that we did in 2019. It's the hiring difficulties survey focusing on Minnesota, Minnesota's manufacturing sector. So this kind of builds on that idea um, that, you know, employers really, um, Employers who don't invest in their workforce uh, tend to have more hiring difficulties as a result. So the study covers um, many areas of recruiting, hiring, and on-the-job training in, in an attempt to understand which jobs are hardest to fill and why. Um, but I'm only going to focus on a couple of takeaways from, from um from this study. So the blue bars on the left show that employers who offered structured on the job training had less difficulty filling open positions than employers who did not. The green bars in the middle show that vacancies that resulted from turnover other than retirement were more difficult to fill than those that did not. So, so those that just opened up as um, a result of um, retirement or that opened up as a result of expansion um, uh, were less difficult to fill. So developing policies, training, and career advancement opportunities that limit turnover has the positive outcome of lowering the share of difficult to fill vacancies. Unfortunately, it's easier for, so the, the gray bars show that it's easier for larger firms to offer um, this kind of training and career advancement opportunities than it is for smaller firms. Um, firms that do not have structured training and advancement opportunities might benefit from working with their workforce strategy consultant to find programs that are available to them to help them develop or expand their strategies. So on the job training and career advancement are two things that we measured in this study, um, and they and they I think affect young people, probably young workers, Gen Z workers, probably the most in in most businesses, because these are the workers that we saw have the highest um, rate of switching um, and benefit the most or are looking for opportunities to advance their career and their wages. So providing those opportunities within your company could help you retain these workers and grow these workers. Um, and, and providing that opportunity in a very structured way can also help you recruit these workers because, because young workers in particular are looking for ways to grow their careers. Um, one thing I do want to just conclude with is thanking employers um, on this call for providing most of the information that I um, discussed today. Um, we couldn't do this research without you. And um, this particular, the last slide that I showed uh, involved um, extensive interviews with employers. So thank you. Thank you, Orion, so much. And, uh, you know, I think this data also sh highlights and shows us that there's opportunity for businesses to make um, investments and in looking at wages, but also 
in the um, on the job training and um, different ways that um, we can build a positive culture within those training opportunities. So um, let's go ahead and start our, uh, our panel discussion for the time we have left. So I would like to start um, by centering our youth voices who are here today. So uh, Cadence and Shania, um, and we'll go with Cadence first and then Shania. So as you enter the workforce, what are the qualities that are important to you in a nurturing work environment? So Cadence. Hi, can everybody hear me? We can. Lovely, okay. So um, the qualities that are important to me in, in a nurturing work environment are, well, a workspace that has a healthy culture. So coworkers, um, there's a, among the organization, there's no shame in needing to like take a day off, pay time, um, office is, is flexible. Another thing is mental health is a central focus. Um, that kind of ties into paid time off being flexible as well. Um, and lastly, questions I think should always be welcomed. Like um, if there is an organizational process that is the way it's been for a certain amount of time, the question of why do we do this? Um, why is this a process? Why do we need to have this should always be welcomed. Thank you, Cadence. And Shania, how about you? Yeah, so I think that a good work environment has a good balance between uh, structure, accountability, as well as what uh, Cadence was mentioning about like having a, a healthy um, mental health space as well. And I think it also has aspects of teamwork and, and independence and making sure that roles are, are clearly outlined within that as well as uh, having a, a range of diversity, um, an appropriate amount or people with different walks of life to make the general feel more comfortable, as well as um, I think nurturing is also about making an effort to acknowledge some of the barriers that some people face and provide solutions and accommodations. Yes, thank you so much for that wisdom, both of you. Um, now let's hear from our program perspectives that are here. So we're going to go with Eric, then Casey, then Misa, and then Stephanie from Story Arc. So what are some inclusive practices, processes, or policies that you've integrated into your programs to support the diversity of identities, experiences, and needs of youth? So we'll start with Eric with Stillwater Schools. Yeah, when I, when I talk about comprehensively incorporating the student leaders into the education process. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So the, the first piece we do when, when they're walking alongside our teachers and doing professional development, we really ground them in the why they're doing the work. So we, we do this activity around all of our 300 summer success scholars have what we call a vein of gold within them. And the job of the student leaders is to extricate that vein of gold, to bring that out, to help those young scholars see that in themselves. So we really wanna create a framework where the work itself is valuable. The second piece is really helping the adults in the equation understand that these are not helpers. You know, again, these are colleagues. And so we create truly meaningful roles and responsibilities uh, for our student leaders. And I think one important one is we have what's called a learning laboratory. So our educators are getting professional development the whole 12 days they're with us. So they identify a strategy, let's say it's around inquiry that they want to try out in their classrooms. And our student leaders videotape them engaging in that activity and then sit alongside them and they deconstruct how it went and work with them to talk about responsive adaptations. You know, incorporating the student lens into the professional practice of the licensed school educator. And then I think there's two other pieces, and I heard it earlier with uh, Federated Insurance. They're doing a really good job of reinforcing the student leader's strengths and celebrating those successes. So what they're engaged in actually starts to become part of their identity. And then finally, we do, you know, have to have courageous conversations at times around meaningful feedback in areas of stretch and growth, you know, because they're they're continuing to grow and develop in that context as well. So 
Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. Uh, next, we'll hear from Casey. Inclusive practices, processes, and policies. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say that Federated has, has a couple prongs to the approach in the inclusive practices, policies, um, and procedures. So the variety, I would say, if, of um, opportunities or internships that Federated offers is the first prong. So from custodian, um, entry-level custodian type roles to customer service, data entry, all the way up to working with our IT. I would say those are all a huge variety of different opportunities that we have for various types of students with prong number two, various types of skills. Um, so it, it can accommodate quite a few um, different career paths really um, at one location. And then third, I would say our relationships in the, in the communities that kind of found our high school internships. So whether that is um, the counselors at the school identifying various types of skills or students that would fit into those different internship opportunities to our workforce coordinator who also is able to connect with um, like our alternative learning center or various schools with students in these age groups that, that can accommodate um, the opportunities that we're looking for. So, yeah, yeah, I think that that kind of sums it up is the the various positions and skills that we're able to to bring in and present. Thank you, thank you. And then next we'll hear from me, Sleta, then Stephanie from Story Arc. Great question. Oh my goodness, I wish I had the um, the magic answer, but. I think overall what I've learned in my career is that, and I speak to the employers in the room, because I used to be on the education side for many, many years, is that employers, we have to be intentional, right? You um, can't sit back and wait for schools or community partners to come knocking on our door, but we have to actually get out there and be intentional in seeking those partnerships where it was in the community they are working with our diverse youth, right? The Mr. A's of the world, um, school after school programs, the Boys and Girls Club, um, lots of times workforce centers, right? They have like a youth arm to their work. So I think as employers, it's kind of assessing your community environment and understanding what is already happening in the community and where can I start making some calls and contacts and build those relationships? And then through that, um, start to have those conversations where you can say, how do we work together? You know, how do I support you? Um, specific to mail, I can tell you that um, you saw on the slide that one of the challenges that we had was what I call the have and have nots. So many times the very experiences that we were trying to get out to BIPOC students was actually being, um, uh, how do I say this? The barrier was actually our own internal staff, right? And their children, right? Because they heard about it or they had the social networks to navigate, to find somebody to sponsor a student as, you know, as a mentor or as a career observation. And so they had all these inside tracks and the very students we were trying to bring in didn't have that social capital. And so we're reframing how we basically create those opportunities and where we push it out to. And then whatever the application process is, we try to make it as simple and clean as possible, right? Or even having like a referral process. Um, we're working through some innovative things right now with our local workforce center here in Rochester um, with some of the students that they work with. So it's like a direct entry point, right? Versus a student has to go through multiple hoops to get to some sort of experience here at Mayo. And then I would say the other thing that we're really trying to hone in on, especially this year and the next year, is ensuring that hiring managers and supervisors that are overseeing students, um, whether it's for paid or unpaid internships, that they're getting trained in, right? They understand the mindset of the Gen um, uh, Z, as we kind of heard Dr. Bowman talk about, you know, the differences. And then how do supervisors and hiring managers create an inclusive working environment so that you know students are going to be intrigued and feel nurtured and supported um, and then hopefully they'll end up choosing Mayo Clinic as their employer of choice right to continue um, their professional journey. Thanks me son and Stephanie with story arc. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to answer this question and to learn from all of the panelists on what they do. I want to thank you all for sharing your wisdom. It's been so helpful to me. And I would say for us at StoryArc, uh, when it comes to inclusion practices and policy, it's about being relational first to ask our staff and the students and the participants that we work with 
tell me more questions to find out where each person is at and what our staff needs uh, help with in order to succeed. And also to realize that this can change with life circumstances and that we as an organization need to be flexible and adaptable to meet people where they are at. And also to know and to build a culture where we ask questions and we listen to what people say and that we will adapt accordingly and that we trust that people and our staff will tell us what they need if we include them and that we can then build a really healthy, inclusive culture off of that when we're all in collaboration together to make a work environment that we all want to be a part of. So that's what I would say. For us, it's being relational first. Thank you, Stephanie. And then, um, so we're getting a little bit close on time and I'm, I'm gonna center our youth voices again. And so I would love to ask um, Shania and Cadence a little bit, this question is kind of about your values. So um, what are the top th um, three or four most important things to you when you think about somewhere that you might wanna work? So Shania, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think the top one for me is definitely inclusivity. Uh, I've seen that when uh, I was uh, worked with Story Arc three times in the past and uh, was a summer success student leader twice and just seeing the amount of um, descriptive representation of our communities and the inclusivity and just making a positive environment where everyone can share their uh, perspectives and stories has really been uplifting and uh, like Cadence Benson mentioned earlier, a work-life balance, as well as um, uh, fair wages, I think are important and addressing uh, quality and the gender pay gap, especially as um, someone who's an, an aspiring position, uh, physician. That's something I uh, think is important, not the most important, but uh, should could be addressed. And then uh, paid time off as well. Thank you, Shania, for that. And Cadence, let's hear from you. Um, well, that was one I 100% agree with everything. So nice to know. For me, uh, top of mind would be uh, Shania, a workplace that is uh, an inclusive workplace. Very important. Um, it's also amplifying inclusivity. With C Cadence, your video is a little show. bit, your, vi your, your audio is coming at like a little bit glitchy. Do you want to? Um, oh, okay. Sorry. There, I think maybe it, it might be better now. I'm sorry. Do you want to maybe turn your video oh, no, off? Sometimes okay. that helps too. You're just yeah. cutting out a little bit. I want to make sure we sure. hear your wisdom there. 100%. Thank you for letting me know. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, that's that's better. Perfect. So for me, uh, a workspace that's inclusive is very, very important. Um, and values the, the company um, exemplifying their values with their employees. I believe it was mentioned earlier in the meeting, but a workspace that shows their values and how they treat their employees. Um, and thirdly, willing to adapt. Sometimes what's been working for like the past 10, 20 years doesn't work the same way. So uh, assessing all the culture and changes um, and adapting to be flexible to shift um, the culture change is very important to me. Well, thank you so much for that. So we are just about at time. So I want to, um, in closing, say a very special thank you to you, Cadence and Shania, for helping to ground us in some very important perspective and sharing um, what's important to you. Uh, we appreciate you and are cheering you on in your career journeys. I also want to say thank you to our panelists for shining a light on some meaningful ways that we can build a positive culture to support our younger colleagues in our opportunities. And um, thank you all uh, for joining us. We just, you know, it's never enough time and I feel like we could have had a whole nother hour. So thank you all for joining and sticking around um, and want to make sure that you um, make a plug for our um, next workforce, work, workforce Wednesday session on May 3rd. Um, that will be on building a culture of worksite wellness, where we will learn ways that businesses can promote retention through supporting employee wellness, health, and mental health in the workplace, uh, which came up today, too. So.
We hope uh, that you can join us then. And thank you all to all of our panelists for a wonderful discussion. Take care, everybody. <laughs>